Good morning. We're adjusting that. Where are we going? We're good? Okay, here. Let me take this off. There we go. It's nice to hear a reply. Uh, welcome to all of you here and online, those who are gathered here this morning as we worship. A couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, for those of you here, just a reminder, uh, let's see here, uh, you're welcome to use the bench Bibles and the stuff in front of you, that's okay, um, they'll be fine by the following week. Upstairs bathrooms are open, please follow the instructions that are posted if you need to use them. Um, from membership, mail slots are available as well. Um, also remember, just also keep your distancing. There also are today booklets available for pickup, they'll be at the door here on the exit. Um, so if you're interested in getting one, it's also available online, um, and you can get it on the Bridge app as well. <clears throat> and, uh, try to see. And, and when we're exiting, just a reminder, keep your physical distancing. You may use any of the exit doors. So the ones downstairs and there will lock behind you. grateful for the opportunity to worship together in person. And going forward, for anyone also, if you're uh, going to come on Sunday, make sure you register to attend. Um, the registration usually starts on the Monday. If you came this Sunday, usually wait until, I think it's Wednesday, um, to register to give others an opportunity. Right now, I think it's not a problem, but as we get a little fuller again, we can anticipate, um, try to kind of alternate the Sundays. Otherwise, later in the week, you can always check uh, to get the space to go ahead and re-register with them. Also a reminder, we have uh, the reminder of the uh, classes-wide alpha course that is taking place. It's an introduction to Christianity, a great opportunity to bring any friends or family or anyone, neighbors, um, to come and to join in online to uh, do an introductory course into what is Christianity and what is the Christian faith. We do have a, a bit of a video to play. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddy and you know would be like invincible but the truth is none of us are and I found purpose I found meaning I found hope God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece Alpha is a place where you can be yourself you can say what you think and challenge everything now, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning.
The course begins on Wednesday, as you can see, and if you're interested, contact Angela. The information was also in the newsletter. Um, it's, it's open to anyone. If you just want to attend, that's fine. If you have a friend to come. If you're interested in leading one of the smaller group discussions or the support groups, um, also contact Angela and let her know that you are able to do that. So. Our call to worship is an invitation that is based in creation. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Let's rise together and let's join our voices in song as we celebrate the God of all creation.
one we follow greets us, welcomes us into his presence with the words of Galatians 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people say, Amen. before the Lord in a prayer of confession. Lord, we proclaim in song that you are our Lord, our God, and our salvation. It seems to be that we want to bring all our worship to you, but we need to confess that as we live in between the times, the time of your first coming <clears throat> and the time of your second, that, Lord, we are still in the midst of our battle with sin. We know that you are victorious, and yet it is still in between. We are waiting for the full consummation of that victory. So, Lord, we confess that while we have worshipped you, 
we have also bowed to many other gods, gods of our own self-importance. We become so sure, Lord, that we are the center of what goes on in our lives, gods of our own desires, where, Lord, we even as we have known, it's not in keeping with your will. It has been much easier simply to do what feels right. Do what gives us pleasure. Do what is expedient for us. And Lord, we have bowed before the gods of our culture, a culture that has a deep love of money, success and fame, of leisure and entertainment, and of each individual <clears throat> being the final say in their own lives, that, Lord, we have cozied up to all of that. Pray, Lord, that you will once again remind us of our washing clean in the blood of Christ, that in the claim you've laid on us in our baptism, you've reminded us that we find our cleansing in Jesus. And so, Lord, bring us once again into that place where we are renewed by the power of your Spirit and change us and remind us now and going forward this week. Remind us. For. In all these things we pray.
At this time, we continue our Lent children's messages with another video. We're splashing again. Only this time, it's not at somebody's baptism, and it's not water being turned into wine. Those were times when people were happy to have Jesus in their midst. No, this time I hear Pontius Pilate washing his hands. He says this means he will have nothing to do with Jesus' death. But that's not true. Who is he trying to fool? He doesn't want to feel the guilt of having anything to do with Jesus' death. Doesn't Pilate know you can't fool God? Doesn't he realize that you can't hide from the truth simply by washing your hands? Sometimes you and I act like Pilate did. We pretend when we do something wrong, it isn't our fault, when it really is. But we can't fool God. God knows every time we've done something wrong and every time we mess up. But you know something wonderful? God doesn't wash his hands of you and me. He keeps forgiving us, even when we're trying to hide from the truth like Pilate. We belong to him, and he will never let us go. This story of Pilate washing his hands is found in the Gospel of Matthew. I'd like to read that to you now. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barnabas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified.
As we come to a time of prayer together, I just wanted to share one prayer request. I know some of you uh, may know this already, and some have seen it on Facebook this morning. Mike and Jessica Dreyer are expecting, but the, um, the unborn, their unborn child has major health and development issues. And uh, so they're asking for God's people to be praying for them and for their little one. Uh, they know they're in the Lord's hand, and so is the little one. Um, they're still undergoing all kinds of tests to find out exactly what the situation is. But uh, they're praying that the Lord may uphold their, their child and uh, that they may in time be able to meet him or her. And so we will keep that before the Lord now and remember them in prayer through the week as well. Let's pray. We declare that you, Lord Jesus, are king. Not me, not us, not anyone in this world. You are king. You are sovereign. You are the owner. You are our master. And yet you are our brother and our friend. Because of your blood spilt for us, you have brought us into fellowship with God. What a wonderful hope, Lord. What an amazing gospel news. And yet, Lord, we know that there is so many and so much in this world that is in desperate need of this kingdom good news. We know this is a world in turmoil in so many places. We want to pray this morning for our brothers and sisters in Iraq, in Iran, and Saudi Arabia. They live, they worship, they disciple, they share the gospel under so much threat and pressure. Lord, we give you thanks that this past week that one of the Muslim main leaders did speak of how Christians in Iraq also need to enjoy the same freedoms and protections as the rest. We see that as a gift from your hand. We pray, Lord, for those around the world who struggle. We think of the girls who were kidnapped in Nigeria. We are grateful they are returned, but we know, Lord, this is a continuing cycle. And so we pray, Lord, for an end to injustice there and an end to terrorism there. And Lord, that our brothers and sisters in Christ there may be part of the peacekeeping that goes on, the peacemaking. We know there is much deep need. We are going through COVID still here, Lord, but we have so much support and so many resources, even though, Lord, at times we complain and we, we get frustrated by restrictions, yet, Lord, we are still in our homes, clothed, fed, working or being provided for in many different ways. How awesome a God you are. And so, Lord, we pray for communities around the world that are in times of devastation, of starvation, of lack of basic necessities we just take for granted. And so, Lord, we pray for your hand of mercy and provision there. We pray for the hands team and for Morgan. Lord, we know a number of them are seeking to stay another year. We pray for a speedy pro processing of their permissions to do so. We pray, Lord, for the communities they are entering and serving in your name. We think especially of the Ben Denny people. Lord, we pray for your power, glory, honor to be present for all worship to be given to you, Jesus, and all other spiritual bondage to be broken in your holy and powerful name. We pray for protection for your ambassadors among these people, that a breakthrough may happen and that people may come to know the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of all lords, and that we may give you praise in that. Lord, we pray that you give us hearts that love our neighbors, near, far, that we do so with wisdom, with graciousness, with servant hearts, especially as we continue through this pandemic journey, that we support others, Lord, especially those who give us guidance when entering buildings or places that tell us to do certain things, that, Lord, we do so with thankfulness and we thank them. For, Lord, we see these protections as a gift from you to keep us healthy, we're grateful for them. 
But Lord, we know that many are struggling with COVID. We, we think of Tim and Kathy and other families in our communities dealing with this. Or at home in isolation, some of them feeling ill. We pray, Lord, for your healing mercy. We pray for patience in this time. We pray, we pray, Lord, for protection for all. Especially, Lord, we think of frontline workers and those whose contact with people in crisis requires them to constantly be in the presence of possibility of getting sick. And so, Lord, will you protect them and continue to strengthen them? Lord, we think this morning of Mike and Jessica and their families. We pray, Lord, for them. We pray for their unborn child. We pray that your perfect love will drive out fear. and That you who can do all things, who know us before we exist, that you will grant healing mercies to this little one as well. Lord, may they rest in your gracious hands. And Lord, we pray for continued healing for Chris and for Bill, for others, Lord, in our communities or in our circles that are struggling to recover from injury. May you grant them the grace of healing, but more so the grace of your presence to continue to draw near and draw hearts to you. And we continue our prayers for Bill and Mary. We want to give you thanks, Lord, for a mostly smooth transition for Mary to a different hospital. Lord, it's what was needed, but Lord, it's not something that is really welcomed. It's difficult. It's farther away for Bill. It's a different setting. We pray, Lord, for the staff there to be given all that they need to care for her and so many others in, that are struggling with Alzheimer's and dementia, and that you'll give them all your peace and your nearness day by day. And also, Lord, as together we wait for resolution of their son's disappearance. May you continue to fill us with your comfort and grace. Lord, may we see all these things through the eyes that come by faith, eyes that are opened by your Spirit, so that we might see beyond what we can physically see into what is really transpiring in this world. Our God, above all, ruling and bringing about his will for the glory of your kingdom. And as we open your word, may you, by, by you, Holy Spirit, may you open our hearts and our ears and our lives to hear again who you are, what you have done, and so what you call us to in many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We return to the book of Revelation this morning in Revelation chapter 5. You can find it on page 1,083 in the Bench Bible. Revelation chapter 5. We're going to read the, the chapter together. If you're picking up the Bible, just the dust off the top. Revelation chapter 5. We begin reading at verse 1. <clears throat> the vision continued that's given to John. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, 
which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creature loud voice they sang worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and then I heard every creature in heaven praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The book of Revelation, as we are coming to know it, is one that strives to bring the gospel message in a very visually striking way. And this is much more so even true now in chapter 5. And the Christians living in ancient Asia Minor were surrounded by images. This was very fitting for them. But so it is for us today, perhaps even more. We are surrounded by visual images of all kinds in our culture. This is the visual age, not the reading age anymore. We are so used to this, though, that it it doesn't strike us as really that significant. But have you ever visited any historical locations in Ontario where you can go and walk through houses that people lived in, uh, let's say over 150 years ago? Ever gone to any of those recently? For example, this past summer, my wife and I went to Balls Falls, the historic village there. And it's not that far from here. And you can go and you can, you can go in some of the buildings. You can peek in other, in, a, in other ones. And there's, maybe there's old log houses or wooden houses that people used to live in when there was still an operating mill there. And if you go there, you'll notice a few things. First of all, you notice right away, especially since I'm six foot two, that the beds are really short. And uh, I don't know, were people just shorter back then? Or was it cold and they all kind of crunched up all the time in bed anyway? I don't know. But you also notice that there's not a lot of furniture, and what is there is very functional. It's all for a specific purpose. And if you take a few moments to look around in any of the rooms, you'll notice very few wall hangings or pictures. In these old historic villages, and I've seen that elsewhere in different places in Canada, there's always very precious few images or pictures or visuals available that impact the the people that were living there. Boy, so different today, eh? I mean, we all know and and recognize immediately all kinds of symbols around us. I mean, you have the the black or white check mark with a swoosh. What is that? Nike, right? So, by the way, a Greek word that means victory. You all know what the giant yellow M stands for when you're hungry? Right, McDonald's. And uh, maybe the other arrow that goes in the other direction that has the little line on the end... The smile with the line, you know what that is? Anything you've ordered, right? Amazon. You go on and on. Images are displayed all over the place. They're in our life every single day. And they're there to help with product recognition, we're told. And really, it's about consumer manipulation. It's about images and logos that we call them. And they they tell us every day what we are to trust and what's the best thing out there. And it's kind of like if you got anything going, you need a logo. Something that encapsulates your company or your organization so that people readily recognize it and thus come to more and more trust in it. This is not much different than the ancient world in many ways, which it was big business in the ancient world as well. It was all about communicating through images who's in charge and what's important. And so it was all about the local gods and the empire in Asia Minor. It was not that Rome would just take over militarily of an area, but they would also then go to work to transform a conquered people into good Roman citizens. And they did this with the ever-present symbols of Caesar, of Rome, and the gods of Rome. 
where we have roadside billboards galore, they had regular signs about where you should stop and make a quick prayer or a quick offering to the God of commerce on your way to work or the God of fertility on your way home hoping to have children. And every, every major structure in every city was decorated with the emblems of Caesar or with the eagle of Rome. It was all around you. You could not escape it. Well, in chapter 5 here, we have one of the most powerful counter-images of the book of Revelation that speaks directly against Roman power, Caesar power, nation power, corporate power. In fact, against all worldly powers and how they normally assert themselves in this world. And it becomes the most unexpected turn of images here because we live in a world and throughout history, civilizations have risen and fallen in the constant struggle for power and authority to rule in this world. It is still going on today. So John is witness to the heavens, to heaven's throne room. In verse 1 he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And by now we, sh- we should be a little bit more familiar and understand seven. Oh, there we go again. Seven is, the, is not simply John counting them. It is seven as the number of completeness. In other words, this scroll is complete. This scroll is ready to go. It is sealed with seven seals. And the scroll is in the hand of the one who's on the throne in heaven. It's the throne of the cosmos. It's the throne of all that is. And therefore, this scroll in the hand of the one on the throne is the edict of the king. And the implication is that these are his seals on his scroll. And it's written on both sides. In other words, we could say it is filled up completely. It's ready, it's done. Scrolls were the common books of the day, so to speak. And so John, in seeing this, would not be incredibly shocked by something different. He would see what's familiar. He would see the throne of the power that is ruling and the edict of the king. And then verse 2, he says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Now, this is a a declaration that is not just spoken in heaven right there, spoken to John. It is, in fact, uh, phrased in such a way to show us it is is declared by a mighty angel with a loud voice, intending to mean a voice that extends to the far corners of the universe. Because verse 3 says, But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, meaning the abode of the dead, could open the scroll or even look inside it. No one. The scroll represents the will of the de- and the decree of the king about all reality. There is no one found in all created reality who could open it, meaning to enact God's will, bring, carry it out for the Lord, and even know what's inside it, even know God's will. No one was found. And then verse 4 writes, John writes this, he says, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So why? Why does John break down like this and weep? It's it's a sense of weep uncontrollably. It's certainly not because he's disappointed, he has some curiosity, I wonder what's in the scroll, and he doesn't get access to it. No, John weeps because he understands what the scroll is in the hands of him who sits on the throne. It is the will and plan of God himself for all of the world, all of creation, all of history. And so John's weeping resonates with all humanity's longing to understand the great questions of why. Why is this world as it is? Why the suffering? Why the loss? Why all this evil and wickedness? Why are there victims and oppressors? What is God doing about it? It is the cry of anyone and all who have hurt and do not know why this is and what will come of it. The answer is in the scroll and no one can get it. 
Romans 8.22 speaks of all creation groaning and that, that we also groan inwardly longing for our full redemption, longing for, to see the plan worked out. It is the weeping of the cry of Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? John's is the weeping of the cry of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. The answer to those cries and the weeping of all who have suffered in all places, in all time in history, the great why and how of it all, the plan is written in the scroll. And so the scroll, finally we will know. We will know how does the world make any sense as we seek to obey the Lord. How can this be made right again after so many millennia of godlessness and sin? John weeps for the answer. The will of God is in the scroll. He weeps for no one is found who can reveal it and enact it in the name of the king. And then verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The elder, in saying so, declares who this one is. He's saying he is the one who comes in fulfillment of the scriptures because he is the fulfillment of the words all the way back of the patriarch Jacob. In Israel, Genesis 49, 9, in the blessing Jacob lays on his sons. And when he comes to Judah, he says this. He says, Judah, you are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? Lion of Judah. And then J Jacob said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. It's reaching back all the way to that promise where the elder is saying, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then they, also the promise continued through King David, where God promised to David that one of his offspring will sit on the throne and rule forever. First Chronicles 17, 14. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. The elder is saying, this is who I need you to turn to, John. This is what I need you to see. Stop your weeping. Hold on for a moment. Hold on, undespairing, John. Behold the fulfillment of God's promises of old. The Lion of Judah, the Root of David, he has triumphed. He is able to reveal and enact God's sovereign will. So from the power of the highest throne of all is carried out the will of the one who is above all others. This is familiar power language to John. It is a counterclaim to the claims of Caesar and his minions, to the claims of the gods of the cities and towns and villages of the land. Finally comes one who is more powerful than all the military might and manipulation and wealth of any nation and any person back then or now. Behold, look, here he is. And then verse 6, John writes, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And this is the great turn of image in Revelation. In this one change of image, this one sudden turning upside down of what John is expecting, we have the uniqueness of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ in this one change. For all other ways to seek salvation are rooted in strength of effort, our efforts in some way. Our natural sinful human tendency is to seek after our own rescue by applying some method, some wisdom, some know-how, some effort, some physical, mental, emotional, spiritual thing we could do, some path of action that we can do to get ourselves 
to God, out of this mess, right with him. All other religions of the world have, would have you strive in some way to reach God. It is dependent in some part on you. And all the world seeks power to progress somehow to a better thing. And here in the midst of all the images of power and might in Rome of, and of today, the one who comes, who can open and enact the will of the most powerful of all, the only wise and sovereign God, behold, a lamb. John's word here is specifically not a sheep, but a young lamb looking as if it had been slaughtered. Now this is to bring us all the way back to the Passover lamb in Exodus that the Israelites had to slaughter on the final day of their rescue from slavery, whose blood had to be put on the doorposts of their homes, that, that when the destroyer went through the land, they would pass over the houses of the people who were under the blood, the Israelites who obeyed. And so here, John sees the lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah, the promised descendant king of David's line. He sees it is indeed Christ, Jesus, who died, who is our final and true Passover lamb, the lamb that was slain. Our sins are taken away through his blood. And the starkness of this sudden turn in imagery is really kind of difficult for us to grasp. But it goes from the power of this world. It goes from power in God's throne to suffering and death. That's how God's plan for all the cosmos is carried out. And if we think about it, this is so countercultural, so non-intuitive for the way we live. That meekness and suffering for others, that that's not a way of defeat. It is a way of life. But self-interest and our own pursuits, that's not the way of life, but leads only to death. In our world today, where powers that be continually test each other, militarily, economically, culturally, aggressively, Christians are called to live in the reality of the Lamb that was slain to suffer in the name of Christ for the sake of others. From roaring lion to a small lamb that was slain. This is the way of God in this world. And if you think about this, whenever you have Christians or churches that tend to look like they're just vying for power or popularity as the way to go about their business, you know that they are following the powers of this world. That's the natural way we all live, and not that of the lamb that was slain. Now John sees that this lamb that was slain is standing it's not dead, but alive, standing in the center of the throne encircled by the living creatures and the elders. In other words, this lamb, Jesus Christ, whom John the Baptist proclaimed as the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this lamb is the Lord God in the person of Jesus Christ. John writes, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. There it is again, seven. He had complete, whole, eyes, all seeing. This lamb knows all, has all knowledge, all wisdom. And the seven spirits, or if you see a footnote in your translation, also translate sevenfold spirit being the Holy Spirit poured out in God's people, the spirit present on earth while Jesus stands at the right hand of the throne. Christ Jesus is God most high, as the Father is God most high, as the Spirit is God most high. Here again, a display of the triune nature of God, one God in three persons. The Lamb, he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, verse 7. You remember all the weeping of history, of all humanity, over suffering, death, and destruction that seems to our eyes to be the only constant in life. Remember your own suffering, your own struggles. The one who can indeed bring God's answer to that is the one who died to save us from death and judgment and rose again to bring us home to God. In other words, the hands that take the scroll are the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. 
And in that moment, when he takes the scroll, there is the swelling of worship and praise that is to God Most High. First, the four living creatures and the elders fall down and worship. John writes, each are holding harps and golden bowls full of incense, which he says are the prayers of the saints. Isn't that something? He is echoing the words of Psalm 141, 1 and 2, where it says, O Lord, I call to you, come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. In the mess of our lives, troubles that we all deal with in different ways, worries, fears, in times of suffering and grief, As the Lord's people, we turn to the Lord in prayer, and we really want God to hear them. Does he? Or in those darkest times, is my voice only reaching as far as human hearing will allow? Revelation 5 here says, yes. He listens. There before the throne are bowls of incense prayers, our prayers, set before the throne but not just before the unimaginable power and glory of God, but before the Lamb who was slain for the healing and salvation of His people. When we pray, and we pray in Jesus' name, we do so because it is He to whom our prayers go, so that in grace, God receives them. You know what that means? That means no matter how pretty your praying is or how ugly it is, It doesn't matter if you're using proper or correct words when you're praying. It is a matter of crying out in honesty with yourself before the Lord, whatever it is you are bringing. And it is given before the one who died to purify us from all unrighteousness. That means our prayers as well, as broken and misguided as they might be, are purified by the blood of Jesus. That's where the bowls are. And then if there's any doubt about who this lamb is, the words of worship make that clear. Verse 9, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Because Jesus Christ, you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased persons for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is our substitutionary atonement of the gospel, that Jesus died in our place. He substituted himself for us to make atonement. He paid for the sin in our place, paying our debt of sin, purchasing us for God. It's good to be together again in worship, isn't it? It's good for us as worship team to hear voices sing. How many of you have ever been in a large stadium at a time of worship at some point in your life? Right? A number of us have done that. Maybe it's a concert even sometimes. You know, the worship team or the band or the choir, they, they sing a song to the Lord with all gusto and skill and it's moving. And then they, they turn and they invite the whole audience to join in and the, the space is filled with a sound of praise such as we usually don't hear that much and it's really quite moving. Well, picture this. Verse 11, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 is John's way of saying, I have no idea, look at them all. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they sang. Can you imagine? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Closest approximation I can find is maybe go home, go online, find the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing Handel's Worthy is the Lamb. Crank it as loud as it'll go. We start to get a sense. John actually puts in here seven ascriptions of praise. Worthy is the Lamb to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Seven of them. Namely, the Lamb is worthy to receive it all. And then, 
beyond our imagination, beyond all stadium walls and seating capacities, beyond all the places in this world, all time brought together into one place and moment. Verse 13, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and power forever and ever. Three pairs, triune God, every creature, Nothing and no one in all creation will be able to ignore the truth. God's will is carried out by the Lamb by whom and only by whom we are saved. No other is worthy of worship. In the center of God's divine plan, His perfect will... When you wonder, what is God doing in my life? I don't get this mess that's going on. I don't want this pain or suffering. Lord, what are you doing? What is your plan? In the middle of that plan is a costly grace beyond all price that has purchased us from death to life no matter what. In a world with powerful people and businesses and governments and wealth and fame and broken systems of life interwoven that all seem so inescapable, God brings about his plan in a completely different way than the world does, than we would want to. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. God's rule comes through the Lamb who was slain for our salvation. That's why Hebrews 4 says, Let us approach the throne of God, the throne of grace, with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's to the Lamb that we turn. Let's pray together. We look forward to that day when we hear all creation praising you. We know that day is both here and coming. Lamb of God, You are worthy. We praise your name. Every time we gather for worship, whether in church, in a home, with a friend, out in a field, walking, whenever we praise you, we join our voices to that scene. Help us, Lord, to remember you are in the center. Lord God, when we are struggling, hurting, feeling abandoned, when life takes bad turns for things that we have done or things that have happened to us, Help us, Lord, to see the Lamb, that it was the one that was slain, that is standing alive because we belong to you. Lord, bless the worship we have offered here today. May it be received through the grace of Christ and may it be joined to the voice of the angels. We thank you that we can dedicate our lives and everything in it to the worship of you. Lord, bless also our giving as part of that worship. Offerings for this church that belongs to you, for the Christian Reformed Church that belongs to you, for World Renew, an organization that belongs to you, all of us seeking to give honor and glory to you. We pray a blessing on all those who receive the ministry of the gospel through the hands of giving and help, that it may bring yet more praise and honor and glory to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. God's people say, This time, I invite the deacons to come up to take our offering. It is for the offerings that we take regularly for Bethany and Christian Forum Church. And the specific one today is for World Renew. This is in support and goes alongside the Canadian Food Grains Bank, which our government also adds to as well in proportion to how we give. So may the Lord bless our giving.
Lift your hearts before the Lord. Receive his word of blessing from Hebrews 13. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people say, Amen. Oh.